So in this brief video, we're going to discuss the system and some of the ways that we describe the system, as well as some basic anthropometric measurements, uh, give, go over a quick review of anatomical terms that you should be already uh, familiar with, as well as global and local reference frames to which motion can be described and quantified. And finally, I'll introduce you, introduce you to the concept of the kinetic chain. So in my previous videos, I talk about how we use the basic principles of mechanics, namely statics and dynamics, to understand the kinematics and kinetics of human motion. And really, in since we're concentrating on human motion, we're concentrating on the human body or parts of the human body, say the shoulder or the pelvis or the trunk. Well, those specific structures or organization of structures whose state of motion we're interested in is known as a system. And so let's take, for example, the runner above me here. And runner comes in, is interested in... Um, you know, you, uh, at having a biomechanical analysis in order to improve his, improve his running performance or lower his risk of injury. So the system could be um, his pelvis. It could be his center of mass, which is essentially a, an indicator of whole body mechanics. Or it could be a part of his body. It could be the his, his foot and ankle. It could be the tibia. It could be the knee, whatever. Whatever part of the body or whole body part um, in which we're trying to analyze is known as a system. So a, a biomechanist or a clinician who is using biomechanical an analysis to understand either the risk of injury or some of the ways that we treat this injury or just running perf or, or performance of an athletic movement will use these mechanical prin principles to understand what the human body or parts of the human body is doing. So let's take a runner here, for example. Some of the questions that we need to ask um, when a, a runner comes in and, and wants to get a biomechanical analysis is first of all, what's a sport? Is it running? Is it long distance running? Is it, is it sprinting? Uh, is it part of a track and field uh, uh, team, cross country? Um, you know, what injury are we interested in looking at? So if we're looking at runners, we may be interested in um, tibial stress fractures, shin splints, uh, runner's knee, uh, patellofemoral issues. Uh, so ultimately that's going to determine the body part or system whose motion or mechanics we are interested in analyzing. So in this case, if we're looking at shin splints, we may be interested in the foot and ankle. Um, it's also, uh, even though we may be focusing on a specific body part, we also be, should be cognizant of the fact that other body parts or other joints and segments will also influence that body part, as you know. So the body is, is a length of what we call rigid body segments. And so the movement of the foot and ankle will influence what the knee does and vice versa. Uh, we need to know the age of the, as well as the sex of the system and some of the, um, what's called the anthropometric um, properties of the system. And I'll go over that here in a, in a few minutes. So runner comes in, gets a biomechanical analysis. In fact, this is the uh, analysis of that runner in the video I just showed you. And if, for example, we're interested in, I don't know, shin splints, tibial stress fracture, we may be interested in oh, um, perhaps overpronation or supination. So this involves looking at inversion, knee version of the subtalar joint, as well as plantar dorsiflexion at the talocrural joint. And so these are some of the ways that we evaluate the kinematics as well as the kinetics of the human body or of the foot and ankle, as well as the knee. Any one of those cases can be classified as a system. So we know athletes come in in all different shapes and sizes. So we need to be cognizant of the fact of their differences in, in, in height, in weight, in segmental properties. So the discipline that studies these measurements, these proportions is known as anthropometry. And so we can take the anthropometric measurements such as, for example, height and weight or BMI, um, somatotype, uh, in order to determine the influences of these anthropometric properties of the system on the motion of that system. So let's take, for example, a swimmer. I mean, swimmers tend to have, you know, long tor torsos and short legs. Uh, great sprinters tend to have short femurs in proportion to their tibial length. That's what we call a cruel index. Um, so there are different shapes and proportions that 
give these athletes uh, an advantage in whatever sport they do, particularly if they've been practicing or performing that sport for a number of years um, at a young age. I know you know baseball players or baseball pitchers who who started in little league and ended up going to the pros their their body and more specifically their upper torso and their arms are are geared for the 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 stresses and torques involved with uh, baseball pitching it's so these anthropometric measurements is vital in understanding how uh, the mechanical properties are um, that determine the motion of that system. And so whether we're talking about, you know, a cheetah uh, or a, a sprinter and, and, and understanding how these anthropometric properties will influence that motion. Okay, so now I'm going to do a quick uh, review of anatomical terms. So this is something you should be already familiar with if you've taken applied kinesiology or, or any uh, anatomy course. So how do we describe positions of joints and segments. We do this in anatomical terms with with respect to the planes of motion and the axis of rotations, which I will uh, briefly go over in a sec here. So these are terms like proximal to distal, superior, inferior, medial, lateral, and anterior, posterior directions. So the axis of rotation is the line that is perpendicular to one of the planes of motion, sagittal, frontal, and transverse. So for example, the medial lateral axis uh, passes horizontal side to side and is perpendicular to the sagittal plane. The AP axis, the anterior posterior axis, is per perpendicular to the frontal plane and as I show you here. And then the superior inferior axis is perpendicular to the transverse plane. Let's see if this shows up. Uh, there we go. So superior inferior, anterior posterior, and medial lateral. So to understand, for example, movement of the shoulder, and we're talking about shoulder flexion extension, as you know, this occurs in the sagittal plane, that rotation also occurs about the medial lateral axis, same with knee flexion extension. Um, let's talk about uh, hip abduction adduction that movement or rotation occurs in the frontal plane but it also occurs about the anterior posterior axis so uh, this is essentially the reference frame by which clinical uh, movements such as flexion extension abduction adduction internal external rotation um, is measured okay so this is all just brief review now from a mathematical or biomechanical perspective, any motion that we measure of a system has to be done with respect to what's known as a coordinate system or a, a frame of reference. So, you know, if you're giving directions to someone and you're saying you need to go do east uh, and, and turn left, you need to give them a reference point. You need to say, oh, you turn left from the Arco gas station, you know, whatever. Same thing with biomechanics and, and, and generally speaking from a mechanical perspective we're talking about statics and dynamics of the system we have to make these measurements with respect to a coordinate system so a Cartesian coordinate system is something that uh, we use and if you've taken you know pre-calculus or taking algebra geometry that you know you know what a coordinate system is a two-dimensional coordinate system is one in which there's only two axes x and y um, and a 3d coordinate axis is x y and z in which um, they all are what perpendicular or orthogonal to each other so rule of thumb is two axes define a plane Whereas three axes essentially define a volume, right? So X and Y, let's just, I'm sorry, X and Y is shown here. And the cross product of the two gives us the axis that's perpendicular to that plane, right? So I'm not going to go into detail with the linear algebra involved in that. Just know that this is a Cartesian coordinate system. And more specifically, it, it is a right hand, right hand Cartesian coordinate system, okay? It's three dimensions. Um, so if we wanted to measure the motion or rotations of uh, an object or of a system, we need to define the coordinate system to which that measurements are made. So there are two, essentially two types of coordinate system or reference frame. One is known as a local 
coordinate system or reference frame. That is one in which a reference frame is fixed to the object itself. And the other one's called a global reference frame. So this could be the room, it could be um, the field or, or the core. And there are techniques in motion capture in which we define that global coordinate system with an L frame and whatnot. I'm not going to go into detail on how we do that. But depending on the coordinate system we use to make this measurement, it ultimately determine to, uh, the, the quantities in which we make those measurements. Apologize for that. I keep hitting my mic. So I have here uh, a football. And the football here has a local coordinate system. So as this football is um, is traveling or is is in the air, with respect to its global, I'm sorry, its local coordinate system, it's going to be zero the whole time. Why? Because it's fixed to it. It's moving along with it. However, with respect to the global coordinate system, we know that that position is going to change. So global and local. Why is this important? Because the human body, as I mentioned earlier, is made up of a multiple, multiple rigid segments. So there are more, uh, multiple coordinate systems or local or somatic coordinate systems that are attached to, say, for example, the trunk, the pelvis, the femur, the trunk, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Why is this important? Because rotations such as shoulder flexion extension or um, hip abduction adduction or ankle dorsi plantar flexion are measured um, as angles between adjacent segmental coordinate system local coordinate system and there are ways in which we make those measurements that you, you would take in an advanced biomechanics um, course but those are perfect examples of local reference frames or coordinate systems uh, one angle or one rotation that's measured with respect to the global reference frame typically is the pelvis, right? So these are rotations such as anterior, posterior tilt, um, obliquity, and rotations. Anyway, I'm not going to go into um, um, details uh, as to what those are. Okay, uh, so as an extension that, of that, if we're trying to understand how forces and torques influence the movement of the system, we use what's known as a free body diagram. And if you've taken physics before, even just a basic physics uh, course, you'll understand what an FBD is, a free body diagram. It's just a diagram of all the uh, uh, the effects of the forces on a particular system. And so in this example here, I've got a system that is essentially the, the upper arm and the lower arm of a person carrying a, um, a weight. And the weight of that, um, um, I should say the weight of the weight <laughs> of the barbell um, is a certain distance away from the elbow joint. So that's gonna create a certain amount of torque. Right? And so this is how it looks. Uh, so we use a free body diagram to understand the influence of, uh, of that torque on the elbow and how the biceps, for example, should contract in order to balance that torque. What we call uh, what that weight here, let's say this is the, the barbell and the forearm. So the weight of both the barbell and the forearm itself would cause the elbow to go in, into what's called an uh, elbow extensor torque. So to, contra, to counter that, you have to contract your biceps in order to create a flexor torque to, uh, to essentially balance those forces or the effects of those forces. Um, the ankle is another example, the tail accrual joint. Uh, when someone is walking, the ground reaction force causes the, uh, at heel strike will cause the the ankle joint to go into what's known as passive plantar flexion and so in response to that the the person would contract their their dorsiflexors in order to counter that anyway in subsequent video lectures um i talk about extensor and flexor torques and things like that so anyway these are just examples of how we use a free body diagram to demonstrate the actions of forces from external forces such as the ground reaction force as well as forces due to uh, joint reaction, bone on bone forces, and muscle contraction. Uh, this here again is should be a review for most of you and then these are just the actions in the sagittal, frontal, as well well this one is specifically in the sagittal plane so these are rotations in the sagittal plane for the hip the ankle the shoulder the wrist joints and, and the trunks of flexion extension for the most part 
And in the frontal plane, I apologize for that, I didn't want to confuse you. Uh, this is again for the shoulder, for the wrists, uh, for the trunk, as well as for the hip. Uh, these uh, rotations uh, such as shoulder abduction and adduction occur about the AP axis, right? The anterior posterior axis, which is perpendicular to the frontal plane. Uh, transverse plane rotations this is mainly internal external rotations. Say, for example, of the trunk, um, of the forearm, we call that supination pronation. Uh, at the shoulder, it could be either internal external rotation or horizontal abduction adduction again most of these rotations occur about an axis rotation perpendicular to the transverse plane we call that the superior inferior axis but most motions of the body segment as you know occur in multiple planes at the same time uh, pronation for example is a combination of dorsiflexion, forefoot abduction, and eversion of the subtalar joint, where supination is the exact opposite, involves plantar flexion, forefoot adduction, and subtalar inversion. And I gave that example in the runner when you know when they're landing, they land in a supinated position typically, and they go into pronation, which is controlled by the shoe as they toe off. So pronation supination is actually a combination of rotations. Um, at the subtalar and talocrural joint. Uh, this is just circumduction, circumduction of either the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint, or the hip joint. Now, the number of independent ways in which a system can move is known as degrees of freedom. Uh, these are a number of values that is required to describe the system motion or motion of the system relative to a coordinate system and that typically um, indicates three degrees of freedom for translation and three degrees of freedom for rotation so every joint unconstrained would have six degrees of freedom every joint in the body with unconstrained would have six degrees of freedom however because of ligaments and because of muscle and just pure you know anatomy bony anatomy certain joints are restricted in certain degrees of freedom so the knee joint for example has primarily flexion extension uh, depending on laxity and depending on the injured state of the system it may have more degrees of freedom maybe in translation anterior translation of the tibia with respect to the femur or maybe a little bit of valgus whereas in valgus um, the shoulder mainly has three degrees of freedom right and there's flexion extension abduction adduction internal external rotation so depending on the constraints uh, for each specific joint will determine the ultimately determine the degrees of freedom so let's take real quickly on the on the types of motion that these systems uh, can have motion as you know is just simply change of position with respect to uh, both spatial and temporal frames of reference again fancy way of saying dimensions of space and time um, motion cannot occur without force in subsequent lectures i talk about newtonian mechanics specifically newton's first second and third law and we knew and we know based on newton's laws of motion that a change in motion is directly proportional to the net force imposed on that system so that change in motion cannot occur without some type of external force some type of net external force acting on that system so what can happen well there there are two types of movements. One is translation. This is another way of saying linear motion. So if the motion um, that's along uh, either the X, Y, or Z axis in which all points of the system move at the same time, direction, and distance, we call that translation. So again, for example, translation of the tibia with respect to the femur. If that motion occurs about an axis, a fixed axis or a pivot, we call that rotation or angular motion. Right, so shoulder abduction adduction that is rotation of the glenohumeral joint about the AP axis, the anterior posterior axis. Generally speaking, however, motion typically occurs, uh, it typically involves a combination of translation and rotation. And if you're a PT or an athletic trainer or some kind of other clinicians, we know that injuries typically occur or typically involve an increase in degrees of freedom in either the in either translation or rotation i mean just think about uh, a dislocated or a sublux glenohumeral joint for example that will have more degrees of freedom more uh, uh, i should say motion in translation than it would otherwise would not have 
So translation, for example, if a force is applied directly on the center of gravity that is going to move linearly in a straight line, as I've shown here. Uh, so we call that translation, and that's governed by Newton's second law of acceleration. If the force, however, is a distant, a perpendicular distant away from that, and this is called the center, a line of center of gravity or a pivot point and axis of rotation, we know that this force is going to cause that object or system to rotate. So we call that a rotation about an axis. However, we know that uh, these forces could cause that system to have general motion, which is a combination, as I mentioned earlier, of rotation and translation. So coming back to the human body, I just, you know, just gave you general overviews of the types of movements involved in systems. But in looking at human movement, and more specifically looking at different athletic movements, we can classify how these movements occur based on you know, their beginning and start endpoint. So say, for example, discrete and continuous. A, a discrete type of movement is something like a volleyball serve or a pole vault. They have definitive starting and end points. A continuous are cyclical in nature. The, the, these are cycles of motion, such as walking, um, running, swimming, where they have, where there are no definitive start and end times. Tennis serve, for example. Got Serena Williams here um, has a definitive start and end time. So that is considered to be a discrete skill or a discrete type of movement. Cycling, as I mentioned earlier, is continuous, right? It just continues. There's no definitive um, uh, start and end times. Other types of movements, uh, there's what's known as a repeated discrete uh, movements. These are um, essentially um, uh, movements that repeat itself but in between consecutive movements of the same movement I should or consecutive iterations of the same movement there is a pause or a recovery phase and this is something like rowing or manual wheelchair racing for example whereas serial it is a series of connected motions but each motion is discrete and different from uh, one another so this is rowing this is an, an example that I should show you of repeated discrete motion it's the same motion repeated with re recovery phase in between iterations whereas a triple jump for example is an example of a serial motion okay now finally I want to discuss the uh, kinetic chain I mentioned earlier that the body is made up of a linked rigid segment, number of link rigid segment. That means the body has multiple segments that move simultaneously, may move simultaneously in order to create a certain outcome. In this case, to throw a football or throw a baseball or reaching. So it's composed of connected segments that require, sorry, uh, coordination of different segmental motions. And the the chain in which that occurs, those segmental motion occurs, otherwise known as a kinetic chain. It's a system of linked rigid segments here. And I'll show this right here. It's a system of linked rigid bodies or rigid segments. So um, I'm going to use pitching because that's kind of my bread and butter. It's what I feel most comfortable with in explaining. Um, so uh, pitching is an exa a perfect example of an open kinetic chain. In this case, the pitcher is trying to throw the baseball at 90, 90 miles, uh, 95 miles per hour to a target at 60 feet, 6 inches uh, in, in terms of the, the strike zone. And he is able to create that outcome by moving different parts of his body. He has his legs, his stride leg, his pelvis rotates, is followed by the trunk and ultimately to the shoulder, elbow and throwing arm or, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the forearm. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, it's a complex kinetic chain, multiple segments that move uh, in a coordinate fashion. Uh, sometimes we call this the proximal to uh, proximal to distal segmental motion, uh, for, for example, such as pitching. And so this is example here. They, they, as I mentioned earlier, the, the legs that both the, on both the drive and stride sides um, ultimately move, provide the foundation on which pelvic rotation and trunk rotation occur followed by internal i'm sorry external internal rotation of the shoulder and elbow extension so this is an example of what's known as an open kinetic chain because the distal end is free to move right this guy's throwing a baseball so that's free to move so we call it an open chain movement 
um, a closed kinetic chain is one in which is one in which the distal end is fixed. So, for example, a push-up. They're you know they're essentially using some of the same muscles as I shown you in in the previous example here with pitching, but in this case the end the and aka the hands on the ground is um, essentially fixed. We call that a closed kinetic chain, right? Uh, running is a type of what's called a functional kinetic chain in which all the segments uh, move in a coordinated fashion in order to to move the runner's center of mass or I should say displace in in the the x direction the horizontal direction and so again that's a cyclical motion it involves mo motion of mainly the hip joint the knee joints as well as the ankle joint and um, I go over in details of running gait in uh, another lecture here thank you <laughs>